All right, we are live and welcome, welcome everybody to our Care Together. I know we started just a little bit late, but we appreciate everyone that waited and was patient. I promise that this will be one of the best Care Togethers that you have ever been a part of because we have some two superstar guests. We have a wonderful topic to discuss that not only is something that I feel is very personal to me, but I think is really relevant in our culture right now. It's really relevant. Um, just, just that it's not really discussed all the time. And, and I think we're gonna have a really enlightened conversation. So welcome, welcome everybody. I see a couple of attendees. Let me see here, some familiar names. Um, it's good to see a lot of people that are coming here. Uh, again, my name is Ed Portillo. I'm a program coordinator with NAMI Orange County. I've been with NAMI for about three years. I'm also the co-creator, co-host, or host and curator of our Care Together forums. Um, this is a uh, diversity and inclusion forum. And before I introduce our guests and get into our topic, I just wanted to first say a thank you to our executive committee at NAMI Orange County uh, for encouraging our team to develop this series. And this is an effort to speak to issues that our society is dealing with right now, especially relating to diversity and inclusion. We all appreciate that these are issues that NAMI Orange County cares about. And we look forward to developing more content like this in the future. And fortunately, we are in our second year of doing these diversity, equity, and inclusion forums. And in fact, this is the last uh, care together that we're doing before we present this to our NAMI California conference. So we will be in Orange County in person at the Marriott, Newport Beach Marriott, uh, right across from Fashion Island to share about what we're doing here and our diversity and inclusion forum care together. And um, if you're interested, uh, you can go to NAMICAL, NAMICA.org to get some information on their conference. Uh, but we will be there on Friday to, to present. So this is, um, again, another reason why this is one of going to be one of the best forums that we've had uh, because there's a lot of momentum going into next week. So we appreciate that. Also, you're going to notice that this is not a meeting. Um, if you're seeing us, you're not going to be able to see each other. This is a webinar format. Uh, there is no chat function that we do. So we encourage you, if there is questions, to click on the Q&A button and um, ask your questions because we want this to be as interactive as possible. And um, so many of you might be new to NAMI Orange County. I'll just give a brief overview. What NAMI Orange County does is educate, advocate, and support individuals that are affected by mental health. And so we educate, we have classes for peers, for families, and for parents um, with people that are affected by mental illness. We also educate or support by having our 24-hour warm line. So if anybody needs to talk to somebody or get resources, you can call 714 991-6412. That's 714-991-6412. That's our 24-hour warm line. It's our support line. You can also text that number as well. Uh, we also have mentoring programs that you can uh, get involved with to, to have somebody to talk to and some support. All that information is on our website at namioc.org, namioc.org. And again, um, this is our diversity and inclusion forum called Care Together. And what it stands for is cultivating awareness, respect, and empowerment together. Our mission is to honor and invite cultural awareness and promote inclusivity through shared experience while reducing the stigma that surrounds mental health. And our vision is to encourage allyship through engagement, self-reflection, and self-awareness in the Orange County community and beyond. And I was talking right before we went live to our special guests um, about this topic, and I'm gonna go ahead and uh, introduce them. And first of all, introduce um, my friend, Mitzi Dorbu. Uh, Mitzi Dorbu is a multifaceted artist, storyteller, singer, poet, and actress who has spent years as a public relations professional. She has had the pleasure of being part of the Berkeley College of Music in-house public relations team, the Roxbury International Film Festival planning committee, and providing marketing and membership services for the Coalition of Schools Educating Boys of Color. K-O-S-E-B-O-C. As part of the largest New England film festival celebrating people of color, Mr. Wu saw the immense, immeasurable power of film to present voices, provide meaning, context, and create room awareness for those narratives that are usually not given a platform. 
Ultimately, Mitzi desires to present stories in a way that brings empowering revelation, freedom, and identity through as many for art forms as she possibly can. Hello, Mitzi. Good to see you. Hello. Thank you for having me. It's such a pleasure to be here. Glad you're here. And next is Jordan Fuko. Jordan is a New York Times bestselling author of the series Ray Bear. She's a Nublia Award, Ignite Award, Abbey Award, and Hugo Lodestar finalist. And she's been featured in People Magazine, NPR Best Books, NPR Pop Culture Hour, and All the Top Ten. She writes about Black a magic, Black girls who aren't magic all the time because honestly, they deserve vacation. Afuko lives in Los Angeles with her husband, David, and their three-legged Trustafarian dog, Reginald Ovin Kuma. And she also, uh, I understand, is developing her series, Ray Bearer, into a Netflix series and is doing some comics, I think, with Marvels. She has a lot going on. Hello, Jordan. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, lots of tongue twisters in my bio. Um, yeah. <laughs> Well, we're glad we're all here and, and we appreciate everyone taking their time to talk about this important topic. We, um, we This is something personal to me. And this is something about uh, the idea of being seen, of representation and why it matters for minorities in the public square. Uh, I was just telling Mitzi right before we went live that when I was a kid, there was this sketch comedy show on Sunday nights that starred uh, Colombian sketch comedian John Leguizamo called House of Buggin. And I remember d just discovering it randomly because I would watch Fox on Sunday nights and think The Simpsons was on, X-Files was on. And I was blown away. I was blown away that this little uh, sketch comedy show had sketches about piñatas and sketches about people that were from East LA or somebody that, that looked like me. And it, and it just blew me away as a little Mexican-American boy that I could see myself, I can see myself on screen and how I was just drawn to that. And so I wanted to invite two individuals that have a direct experience in, in that and how that, how that is so powerful and why it's important that we continue to talk about subjects like this. So um, I want to start with Mitzi and uh, Mitzi, the, the idea of being seen, can you, can you kind of like unwrap that with the audience when we talk about why it's important to to for a, a person, you know, people of color, to to feel like they're seen. Yeah, um, you know, yeah. As I was thinking about this topic, I mean, a number of things are that we are fortunate now uh, to be able to see. Uh, like, for instance, we've got like um, what is it? Easter from Joe Joe Coy coming out, right? Who is Filipino? So he's got. I mean, the first time ever we're seeing um, an all Filipino cast um, who are saying we're Filipino and this is about a Filipino family, right? And our experience uh, being released. And then, you know, one of the other things that came to mind was hearing the interview uh, between Viola Davis and Oprah Winfrey about her new book coming out, you know, Finding Me, right? And I mean, in, in looking at some of these interviews, I mean, most recently, again, from Joe Coy, part of what he says is, you know, growing up, right, um, you know, as he was trying to find his identity, right, um, you know, as a, a Filipino kid who's half Filipino, half white, um, not really, you know, trying to figure out who am I, what am I, you know, he would go and see things like Young Guns, this is from the 90s or 80s, you know, for some of us, right? Um, and he saw Lou Diamond Phillips, and he was like, wait, who is that guy? I don't know, who's that guy? You know what I mean? And he was like, I, after that, he was like, I couldn't even really watch the film anymore, because I was just like, who is this guy? He looks a little bit like me. Oh my gosh, you know what I mean? And he was like, I had to see the credits, because I had to see his name, and it was like, I think that guy is, you know, Filipino. So it's this idea of, you know, being able to see people, you know, who look like you, who, you know, might have your voice, who sound like you, who, you know, even if, you know, for some of us, it wasn't so obvious or clear. He was like, then I was on the search, you know, on the hunt to find out who is this guy and, you know, what's he about? And then he also means mentions, I guess it's Tia Carrera, who is also, you know, in, you know, this upcoming film and how he's just like, wait, when he saw her, he was like, 
she looks like my cousin, you know? And um, it was just this sense. I mean, it was like from there, he was saying that then helped to give me vision. Do you know what I mean? That then helped him to, you know, get a sense of him having value or a place, you know what I mean? Um, some, you know, af- affirmation, some acknowledgement, right? Of his existence in this world. And that, you know, um, it would be valid. And he could then from there, like dream. There was a possibility of a dreaming. Oh yeah. I could be that. Or he was saying, you know, from there, then he was like, I can maybe move forward in this. And now, you know, look who we have and someone who's creating the first narrative, right? From just those seedlings. So it is um, just the option of, or just the, the idea that, you know, there is a place for you, that it is valued. Um, uh, the, again, it's like, you know, it's an affirmation. Yeah, it, it, it does. And I actually looked up, you know, some other things that maybe I'll get to later in the night, but just from teens today, we're talking about what it means, you know, for them to see representation. So it, yeah, it, it does help to create a, a healthy bound, you know, uh, like a uh, base, you know, and foundation. Yeah, for yeah, kids. That that foundation is key. That foundation is key to feel that you're you're seen, that you're validated. I think Jordan, if you can kind of touch on that question as well, because in a lot of ways, I like what what Mitzi said about dreaming. You're able to dream, like you've you've dreamed in that space, but creating a whole world in in your book. And and so, can you, can you expand a little bit about that? How important was it in in you creating universes that the representation was there, and how was that process for you as well? Yeah, there's a Juno Diaz quote that I'm going to butcher, but he basically talks about how what makes vampires monsters is that they look in the mirror and nothing's there. And if you don't see yourself reflected, but you see other people reflected, you start to wonder if you're the monster and you do things to make yourself less of a monster. You try and put yourself either in the shoes and Um, masks of people who do get represented. Um, For me, you know, I grew up in a predominantly white area. So there was that, but there was also the kind of black girls that were represented. Um, I had to not only experience my blackness through my own cultural lens. My parents are both black American and Nigerian immigrants. Um, I had to experience it through the lens of what my white peers thought a black person should be. And every time I deviated from that, even if it meant being true to myself, I felt like I was letting someone down. You know, um, growing up in the 90s and early 2000s, I didn't sound like the only black girls when they were on television sounded because the only kind of black girls who could make it in television had to cater through it to a stereotype, right? Um, Either that, or if they were to be a pretty black girl and not just the sassy black friend, they needed to be about five shades lighter than me, preferably with blue eyes um, or green eyes to look exotic. Um, And so I quickly learned that if I was not to be invisible, I would have to be something very different from myself. Um, The problem with coming from an increasingly globalized world is that it's going to be harder and harder to fit yourself into a marketable category. So the Ray Barra books, I always describe them, they're just as multicultural as I am. For marketing purposes, they're marketed as Afro-fantasy. But this is a world, while even though the ruling class are loosely based on the Yoruba, which is my mother's Nigerian tribe, you know, in this world, you see influences of not only West African oral storytelling, but British fairy tales and, you know, what it was like to grow up as a California girl in certain kinds of education education and trends and things like that. It's, I think that um, I describe them as books that are as multicultural as I am. And I think that's an increasing reality. Um, I think that the, the challenges you have with representations is that you still have a lot of white, powerful gatekeepers deciding which are the important stories to be told. You'll notice that the top selling stories are always black trauma stories, black hardship stories, because at the end of the day, these stories are still thought of as a tool to educate 
people who are not black. It's like, what do you say the white majority of buyers need to know? They need to know how to be anti-racist. They need to know about the hate you give, all this stuff, which is true, which is important. But when you think about the kids who actually look like these people, seeing the only story about them told over and over and over again is one of hardship. Um, I grew up during the heyday of American Girl, right? All of these different kinds of girls in American stories, and they each got their own doll. And in terms of disposition, I related a lot to, um, I think, Samantha. She was like the Victorian doll. Um, and But I loved Addie because of like, she looked like me and had a family like me and got to go on adventures. But it's telling that the only American Girl doll that I got access to was an escaped slave. You know, like it wasn't it wasn't the story of, you know, well, I, I feel I don't want to do Addie an injustice because the author of those books is a black woman who did all she could to make Addie's life still empowering and enriching. She spends a lot of time showing Addie winning spelling bees and stuff like that. It wasn't just like, oh, and I escaped the white master and that's all there is to know about me. Right. Which is the direction a lot of those things go. Um, so what I'm getting at is that representation is important, not only to represent the world as it is, but to give something aspirational. One of the reasons why Black Panther was so powerful is that it envisioned a world in which like, what is Blackness minus the colonialism and the oppression? There's still so much there. It's amazing, it's beautiful, it's powerful. Um, and so we need both. We need stories that tell the truth about the challenges that um, marginalized peoples are gonna go through. And we need stories that celebrate how much more there is to a marginalized identity than from the perspective of an oppressor. I'm getting a little long-winded, but one thing I also want to emphasize is that representation isn't just for the people they represent. It is just as important for white children who are only used to seeing stories told about them to see stories that center other people. Um, there's, yeah, that's a whole other thing I could go into. Maybe we'll talk about it more. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I think that's, I think that's that not only, you know, touches on what Mitzi was saying about it being foundational, it's, it plays into, so it intersects so many aspects. It intersects in a, a, a place of mental health. It intersects a place of history. It inter, intersects a place of culture. And so I, I wonder, Mitzi, putting all, all of this together and going off of what Jordan is talking about, can you talk a little bit more about the, the foundational aspect of it, where, where all these things intersect and how that, you know, plays into our role is, um, moving forward or, or being successful in society? Um, actually, you know, what? I love, I mean, and I had thought about many of those things that Jordan said. So I love all that you touched on because part of what I was thinking is with this whole idea of explaining the importance of being seen. Yes, it's important to be seen, but and even more specifically, um, those depictions that we're seeing uh, being written and produced and directed by people who come from um, who come from the you know the people groups that are being talked about and can pro provide the spectrum of you know a genuine, authentic spectrum that is empowering, right of what it means, what this reality truly means in its many different facets. And so, um, yeah, in terms of having that, that foundation, part of what it does when you aren't um, kind of like a pigeonholed or boxed in or held to, as Jordan was saying, like the, uh, maybe the stereotypes or, you know, the, the ideas or even, you know, the economic, whatever, you know, um, motivations there might be by an oppressor um, and instead are, you know, are actually just from an empowering place or from um, a grounded place or just the place of, you know, again, we're going to go with um, Easter Sunday. And then, of course, Black Panther. I thought about that, too, Black Panther. And, and what it means when you're like, you know, this is our history, you know, and more of its fullness and more of its richness. Um, and in that way, you know, being able to present it in a, in a way that then um, is yes, it can be inspirational. It's a place to dream. And part of, you know, one of the things that, that, that also came to mind to me as I was looking through this or as I was 
watching actually this interview between Trevor Noah and um, a, a Ghanaian um, hip hop artist, writer, et cetera, named Blitz Paule, who is actually the person who directed the upcoming Color of Purple, uh, like it's the Color of Purple 2. Um, and from his perspective, he was just like, yeah, you know, I mean, the story was of course wonderful and foundational and, you know, so much that we learned from Color Purple, right? But he's like, in this series, you know, because I'm coming at it from a different perspective, what we, what I wanted to be able to see was see Seely not only from that traumatic perspective that Jordan said that many times is true is what we get, but seeing a Seely that's able to dream, that is able to see beyond, you know, what, you know, her plight has been and now is in a new place where we can actually see her, you know, beyond the trauma, beyond, you know, uh, being a slave and, and you know, uh, being inspired, right? And being able to aspire to something. And yeah, I mean, it is, yeah, in terms of the, the foundation, um, it laying a groundwork that allows you, that is not just about you seeing, uh, being downtrodden or a slave or, you know, all the trauma of that, but also uh, being able to see beyond and get out of the boxes of, yeah, of an oppressor or from someone else's lens, yeah, that doesn't really know, but is just putting their vision, yeah, up on screen. So, yeah, you. yeah, I, I, I think that's, that's so important in, in the way that we, you know, our lives are interweaved where there's a lot, there's so many things that are constantly intersecting and constantly um, affecting us, whether that's from the media that we, we ingest or that's the interactions with our, our colleagues or friends at school. That's so foundational. I mean, I think that's why in, in many ways um, we, we, we set a lot of our expectations on based upon, you know, what is, what is shown to us. So part of the, the reason why we have this forum is we wanted to create space for individuals that are underserved to be uh, to give a platform to, to, as experts. Oftentimes, when you see you know flyers for mental health um, issues, it's uh, you know somebody that went to a great school, somebody that's usually white, somebody that's it doesn't look like me. You know, it doesn't look like me. They're talking about depression or they're talking about anxiety or they're talking about something that you know is is relatable. And so, oftentimes, people don't feel like they they are in, invited. You know they aren't they aren't invited to to you know intersect with you know the, what we're doing here at NAMI Orange County. So I wanted to to know um, Jordan, what has been your experience since the the release of the book and how that connection has been made with people because they feel that they're invited. They feel that you you made that connection with the the writer of the the um, American Girl, and now in many ways you're doing the same thing with a lot of other girls. So how, how has that experience been for you and in, 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 in developing this, this idea of representation? Um, it's been so precious and interesting. Both of my books were COVID releases. So that was interesting and stressful. Um, the second book is very obviously written during COVID because in tone, it has a lot more to do with those inner mental health issues. These are fantasy books, they're adventures. And yet I wanted to make sure that in this world I've created, all of the protagonist struggles, um, out of all of them, none of them come from her being seen as less than human. In this world, it's this large Pangea continent empire made up of cultures like inspired by West Africans and East Africans and East Asians and North Europeans. And it's like all of them were magically hewn together into this continent that was then made into an empire. And she is actually born into the upper echelons of this place, meaning that so many of her conflicts come from what to do with her power, you know, um, and come from a lot of, let me start the sentence again. A lot of the time when you will see black girls represented, you will see them represented as strong and sassy, you know? Um, and while those aren't negative things, um, it has led to a lot of um, the, represent the struggles of black children and black people being swept under the rug because they're strong, they can handle it. You know, um, they're not depressed, they're just angry all the time, that kind of thing. Um, Tari Sai, the protagonist's name, is, I, I made sure that she was always thought of as something vulnerable that needed to be protected. 
Um, we, have we now have studies showing that white teachers of young black girls perceive black girls as less innocent and less vulnerable than white girls of the same age. Black girls are forced to become women faster because that is how they're perceived. If a black girl throws a tantrum, she's a bad girl. She's not just having a bad day. She's, you know, she's spiteful. She's not five, you know? Um, and so that very much ties into mental health issues where if you have a whole category of people who are perceived as tougher and less vulnerable, then not only will help be, is, it's less likely to be extended to them. You know, you send them to juvie, you don't send them to a psych ward, you know. Um, then they start to see themselves that way as well. You start to see a lot of these things internalized sometimes from black parents. You know, if you if I'd told my parents I had depression, they would have been like, girl, whatever. <laughs> you know, you're, you know, like we, we've had to go through so much, you know, you have so many more privileges than we did, which is true. You know, and I'm just like, well, that has, you know, nothing to do with like my brain chemistry, that kind of thing, you know. Um, yeah, in Redemptor, um, anxiety and imposter syndrome and depression take the form of of actual spirits that haunt the protagonist. You know, like that's one of the cool versatile things about fantasy is that you can, you can give more dimensions to concepts, right? Um, and they are always telling her, you know, this, you're, you're not enough. Like if any of your friends have to like leave and do something, it's because of you, your inadequacies. You need to do more. You need to do more. You need to do more. These are the voices that are constantly in the head of this protagonist, even as like from the outside, she's like kind of ascended and should have the success story. Her own inner demons are causing her to isolate herself more and more and not ask for help and not be with the people who love her and want to help her. Um, I just, I've never read a story featuring a black girl that had that kind of mental health representation. I generally do try and write what I would have needed to read, would have liked to read as a teenager. Um, so yeah, mental health is hugely a part of my work. And I really hope that with all of the, all of the lessening stigma about talking about it, that that infiltrates communities of color more, but most, but also just as importantly that it influences white communities who, you know, largely make up the mental health, um, health giving populace. You know, I had to go to another therapist to get over trauma from one that a white, you know, woman in her fifties inflicted on me. I thought she'd be a great therapist. She had like all this feminist stuff all over her office. And she, said some of the most racist things I have ever seen. Like I'd say like, oh gosh, I don't like that. And she'd be like, why are you yelling? Why are you angry at me? Like calm down. Like, like you know, it was just like, it, she could not handle any kind of negative emotion from, from me regarding race, <laughs> you know, which is one of the things I was in therapy for because, you know, it's traumatizing to experience racism as a black person. And she couldn't handle it despite all of her degrees from liberal universities, despite her being, you know, like, oh, you know, so pro like blue kind of like would have voted for Obama three times kind of person. The fear and fragility she had confronting any kind of racial trauma um, in the mental health of a black person enveloped, like, like it just shoved any education she had out of her head. She just became this thing that she needed me to protect. She asked me to give her a hug, my therapist, to comfort her. She probably needs to be disbarred. Anyway, <laughs> um, that's what we're up against. You know, I have the resources to go seek out therapy for myself. And even when I did, that's what I was up against, you know? Um, it's massive. We have so much more to do in terms of making mental health awareness, but also making sure mental health treatment centers are safe for people of color. You know, if I'd been a different person, I never would have darkened the door of a therapist's office ever again. That's how bad it was. So um, yeah, that's, there's a lot to unpack there. <laughs> If you'll excuse me, I thought that I set up my computer so that like it wouldn't die, but I think I need to plug in something different. I'll be right back because I think I don't want it to die. 
definitely yeah and and i think that's we, we did do a forum actually in february about what mental health professionals miss while interacting with the black community and and a lot of what, you're, what jordan just mentioned was was uh, brought up and um and discussing it and it brings up this question of of cultural competency and and mitzi you you've worked in the professional field with public relations in some prestigious places film festivals I wonder, you know, being in the room when you make decisions and you're able to, you know, give space to uh, underserved voices, um, how important is it that to, that organizations get the idea of cultural competency when they're interacting, when they're kind of moving? How, how, have, you, how have you dealt with that as you're in your professional life? Wow. Um, I mean, it, it's huge. Uh, and, you know, many times when you are in those spaces, you might be, you know, one of a few people of color. And given that, you know, my background was public relations. I mean, with the film festival, part of what was beautiful is, you know, I was part of a planning committee that was all women of color. So, you know, we all, you know, had our different perspectives. We all had our different backgrounds, right? And, you know, in terms of picking movies and, you know, creating the schedules, you know, it was all about uh, providing platforms and, you know, there being discussions or talks or, you know, what this film was going to bring up, right? So, you know, it, it was kind of like what Jordan is saying, it's uh, to be a place of affirmation to bring these narratives of other folks, you know, forward. Um, and also, you know, for the general public to come, you know, uh, whatever club they are with, to, to be informed about this. But when you're in other spaces where, you know, the people who are in power aren't necessarily people of color, but you are, you know, you have a seat at the table, as they say. Um, like I know for me, because I was in public relations, many times I was kind of like liaison between other groups. Like I worked as a liaison between Berkeley College of Music and the film festival. And, you know, what would be great or, you know, if I was writing stories or, you know, um, representing different upcoming events or that type of thing, wanting to be like needing to be able to speak to those people who were involved, um, who, you know, the communities that this was going to serve or, you know, um, the population that, you know, uh, was in, that this was important, whatever the event was going to be about or whatever was being discussed having them and their voice represented, whether it be a press release or, you know, speaking with them or, you know, when you're setting up interviews, making sure, you know, they're able to talk with, you know, a person from the center. And, you know, I'm just thinking about times when there was going to be some type of collaboration and uh, being very certain that, you know, someone from like, for instance, the film festival or, or whatever the film was, or again, whatever organization, was able to have a one-on-one -on -one or be able to connect with the person, you know, on the other side or the organization on the other side, um, their voice would be heard because yeah, cultural context is, is huge. It's huge. It, yeah, it's critical. In a lot of ways, you're, you're, you're wearing many hats. So not only are you in your professional capacity, you're, it sounds like you're also sometimes even need to be an advocate. It sometimes sounds like you needed to to be a mediator or 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 really a translator in some ways. Would you say that 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 you would find yourself in those situations? Actually, yeah. I mean, when you say that, part of I'm reminded of there were times when you know there might have been an artist that was coming to Berkeley, you know, that was going to be visiting. And, you know, someone in my office had no idea, you know what I mean, who this person was because they weren't necessarily well known in the mainstream, you know, music arena or mainstream, whatever. But, you know, for the, the African-American or the Latino community or whatever, they were, you know, they were huge. And so it's like, uh, we need to do a story about this. You know what I mean? Um, there's going to be a whole segment of the population that is going to it's going to be key for them to know that, you know, this person is coming to campus and that there's, you know, an opportunity and that, you know, Berkeley, you know, is involved in, in, and has this, has invited this person and welcomed them in. And it's not just something that only our students will appreciate because of their artistry, but, you know, a wider population because of what they represent. Uh, yeah, will, yeah, will mean. And so, yeah, also just making sure, again, for me, public relations a lot was about, you know, relating to different publics in a way that met their needs, you know what I mean? In a way that, uh, was of service and spoke to them, right? Because that's, you know, it's, it's, it's about a relationship. It's about, you know, and truly 
from a relationship standpoint, you want to have a genuine and authentic understanding of what is going on, the voice and the needs of, you know, all of those people who are involved. So yeah, just as Jordan was saying, it's just as important that these depictions be authentic and that they be from a place that's not uh, from a place of oppression um, or from a place of trauma and give a, a wide ranging, again, like representation and depiction of people for, for those people who are not only just a part of that people group, but outside so they can see and they have an understanding as well. Yeah. So providing that cultural context. Yeah, sure. so that's so important. And, and just to everyone that's here, we, we definitely can uh, get some questions in. If anybody had any questions we wanted to ask any of the panelists, uh, feel free to click the Q&A button and we will definitely get to them as we kind of uh, get closer to six o'clock here. Uh, but Jordan, I this is such an important issue. It, it crosses so many facets that we've kind of we've gone on it seems like we can have like a series just to kind of go over this on all the different topics that we're covering here but i wonder that uh now now we're as a published author new york times um bestseller as you kind of see it from a from a a, a space maybe a 20 20 000 foot perspective now what are some things that you see that are that are hopeful what are some things that you see that are like people are connecting the dots that uh, we can look towards or we can kind of see on, over the horizon? Um, well, I have, I go back and forth on that. I think that it is wonderful that the chances of seeing someone with a face that looks like yours on the shelves of children's and teen literature are greater than they've ever been before. Um, but we're not even close to being done. <laughs> is the thing. You know, there are so many other factors in terms of accessibility. You know, a lot of kids who do look like those faces live in book deserts, like they're never going to get access to those books. Um, books are expensive. Libraries are getting cut funding. They're getting books banned. Um, I know this is a question about hope, but it's like, it's so hard. It's always double sides of a coin for me. I want to cry going to bookstores and seeing all of these books that would have changed my life as a little black girl who loved to read, who loved fantasy, even though the genre of fantasy never ever loved me back. You know, it was, um, you read a fairy tale, you know, it's always going to be like, there's association of purity and innocence with whiteness, you know, maidenhood is, is white, it is blonde, you know, um, heroism has to do with fighting off darkness, always. Um, even the words we use, like his heart blackened, you know, dark magic, like there's all of these things that would have described me were always associated negatively. So to see a more positive representation, even if it has isn't going to reach a lot of children, it's going to reach more children than it ever has before. And I do love celebrating that and resting in that. Um, one thing that I do in my books, anyone who did like a find search on all of the words in my books will notice that any mention of darkness or blackness is always associated with positivity. You know, it's never, even words you wouldn't even expect to, you know, there's no like, um, his face darkened. Um, there's no, um, you know, even the way we describe faces are usually patterned around skin that is pale. So it's never going to be like, oh, he reddened in anger. How are you going to redden? Like you couldn't tell on my face. You know, you have to find other ways to express emotion that are compatible with more kinds of people, right? Um, even the, yeah, so the literature, the, the language we are given even limits us. Um, so to be able to give kids more language is always incredible. When I do school visits, um, and I see faces light up because they're realizing that there's like a whole realm of storytelling that not only can they see themselves in, but they could also create. You know, if she can do it, why can't I? Like, I love seeing that. Um, 
I'm going to share a story real quick from my last school visit out in Chicago. Um, it was at a high school and I was a little intimidated because I was not a cool teenager in high school at all. So to speak to like auditoriums of teenagers is still like, it's still nerve wracking for me at 29. <laughs> um, and this one kid, this black kid, he came up to, you know, my little, like they set me up with like a little thing where I could sign books after, you know, he just like, he didn't say much. And he was like, yeah, can you sign my book? And I was like, yeah, sure, sure. And he almost walked away and he's like, so I'm writing this thing. <laughs> like, I just, I don't know if it's any good or anything, but you know, I just, you know, I have this idea, you know, like he was, he was expecting me to say, and you could tell you did not talk about this with people. And I was just like, I did everything I could to encourage him. I was like, that sounds awesome. That sounds sick. You need to develop that. That's so cool. And you could tell like the way he even put it up, it was such a vulnerable part of him that he was even trying to like dismiss it. Like, you know, it's not really anything. You know, it's just like, you know, it's just like, I like kind of like writing stories every now and then it's stupid. It's stupid. I'm like, no, it's not <laughs> like, that's wonderful, you know? Um, and so to see like these kids open up the, open up themselves, to these possibilities is, it fills me with such warmth and such hope. And the only thing that makes me sad is like how much more we have to go and scope because that nerdy kid, that nerdy black kid, you know, who has these stories, he doesn't show anybody because he wonders if they're stupid or whatever. There are so many of him, right? That I will never meet that might not have access to books with people that look like them. Um, so yeah, a lot of hope mixed with a lot of uh, determination that things for how things need to improve. Oh gosh, I yeah. just <laughs> go ahead, Eva C. Go ahead. Yeah. I'm sorry, I have to like uh, uh, that story is so near and dear to my heart in so many ways. I mean, my mom, my mom is a teacher, but not only that, but she's from Chicago, specifically Southside Chicago. And I mean, I know how nitty and gritty it can be. And I volunteered at some point in what was then, you know, Robert Taylor projects when they were there, still up. They have since been condemned and torn down and whatever, all the things. Um, but just the idea, I mean, especially when we talk about um, young Black boys, and again, I don't know what part of Chicago, right, that could be a stereotype of my own, like who you were in front of, but just the thought of potentially a young Black male who is writing, you know, a story um, about his experience or about fantasy, being able to see beyond and getting that encouragement. Because, you know, like Jordan was saying many times, um, we as Black folks and, and even, you know, other people of color um, aren't, uh, aren't allowed, you know what I mean, to be vulnerable, aren't, um, aren't given the encouragement. And in terms of, you know, that whole like mental illness aspect and, and this idea of, you know, what is presented to us and the stories that we hear and see and the representation and, and not even just what we see up on screen, right? Um, or what is presented on screen, but just like Jordan was saying, the fact that I um, have written you know what I mean? This and when I go to speak about it or do interviews and, you know, have this understanding, I just it's like full circle for me. It's just great. It's beautiful. Yeah, and I think that's that's a great I mean, you can't get more hopeful than that. You know, I, I'm imagining myself as a kid. And I just did a, a sketch comedy at my church and somebody came up to me and said, you have amazing uh, comedic timing. And I was like, it just lit me up. I was just like, whoa, blown away. So I can't imagine. I just, I'm almost, uh, you know, getting a little teary out here hearing this story because I relate to it so much. And, and, and that kid's life potentially could be his trajectory changed just by that, that small interaction with, uh, with you, which is a great way to kind of sum up the hope of what we can look forward to in the sense of identity and the sense of purpose and seeing ourselves in this world as being successful, as being, um, you know, president as being beyond what, what we can see now in the present. So um, with that, we do have some questions. Um, I'm going to get to them. Angelina says, what a glorious, peaceful night, Connecticut. So I think she's watching us from Connecticut or thanks uh, Angelina for that. Um, so Robin says, besides Jordan, has Mitzi had an experience with mental health concerns herself Sorry. or her family members? What has helped her or her family members come to a place of recovery? Mm. Um, so, yes, I have definitely um, 
I mean, both myself, like I've, you know, worked with uh, mental health providers and right now. Um, and, you know, especially, you know, COVID and, and, you know, um, many, I guess, issues and, and personal matters that I didn't know were there that, you know, I had to like, uh, uncover and I'm still kind of processing through. And I mean, I would say on both sides of my family. Um, yeah, there, there have been instances uh, where mental, there have been mental health concerns. Um, and I've, yeah, I've lived through it. <laughs> and in terms of what, uh, what they've done, well, there's, I mean, it's been kind of a mixed bag. I mean, I do have to say, uh, so um you know, part of my family, and I just think it's so, so interesting about both Jordan and I, my, uh, part of my family is from Ghana, West Africa. And then the other part of my family is from Southside from Chicago. Um, and so, you know, there are different understandings and beliefs about mental health uh, support, uh, mental health professionals, and whether or not to use them or not, or even an understanding or belief, kind of like Jordan was saying, what, please, you know what I mean? Like, we've done, there's been so much we've gone through already. Um, and, and even even that's true, I think, even, you know, for, for Black folks or, you know, African-Americans here in the United States. So, um, um, yeah, there's, there's been a range of ways uh, to deal with it. And I think for the most part, before me, it's been more like, okay, we're, we're going to get through this, you know, what I mean? um, more than, you know, stinking some type of mental health professional. But yeah, I, I am definitely on that train. And actually I studied psychology. So, you know, I believe in it. I also think there's a range of things, um, you know, that will help with that, not just mental health, but I think there's also a spiritual aspect. Interesting enough, as Jordan was saying about, you know, these are the voices you hear, um, it not necessarily being external, but there being things that you have to deal with inside that, you know, come from actually, yeah, just some, definitely needing to address your spiritual health and uh, beliefs and concerns and also have a professional as well. So yeah, sometimes, yeah, sometimes you just got to resolve some things with God, with your creator. So there's a mixture of things. Yeah. yeah a, lot, a lot of the toolbox. Um, we, we definitely here at NAMI Orange County want to be part of the, that toolbox. We firmly believe that a lot of what happens in the house, if, if there's a, a bridge that can be built between individuals um, a lot of re re resolution can happen um, with people that have a diagnosis. And so we try to do that with our classes and with our mentoring services, because oftentimes, you know, mental health is, is not as accessible, you know, to get a therapist or even a therapist that looks like you. Um, uh, if you're, if you're black from a, from a, a Hispanic or a person of color. So um, a lot of our, our emphasis is trying to, to bring the family along, to bring the, the individual along to, to empower them and to work through their, the, together to, to build to um, a better situation. So any LP says, thank you for being here. Thank you for your work in our culture. Such an empowering experience for me. Thank you, Annie, for coming. We appreciate that. Um, Latasha says, if you could go back to your younger self, what would you tell her or show her? to help her grow with more confidence and pride in being who she is. This is for either presenter. Jordan, if you want to take that, I can follow you. <laughs> um, I would tell her that there's no wrong or right way to be Jordan because I was constantly trying to figure out the right way to be a black girl. Um, whether that was trying to take cues from people who didn't like blackness to trying to take cues from stereotypes of blackness. Um, I think that when you're a kid, you want things to be black and white, um, no pun intended in terms of just like how things are supposed to be that, you know, even, even with like, as a little girl, you're told, like, I remember one little girl told me like, oh, well, girls hold their books this way at school and guys hold their books this way. Like, that's the way you're supposed to do it. Like it's that specific in terms of, oh, okay. So I'm a girl. So this is the right way to hold books, you know, like imagine that applied to everything about you, about being like a girl, about being a black person, about, you know, like, I wish I could have told her that um, all people are weird and wonderful and it's 
you need to embrace the things about you that are just the way you are, even if it doesn't fit in with what a black girl is supposed to be, what a white girl is supposed to be. Um, it's okay to just be. And I think stories would have helped me with that. I loved stories, but I had to embrace these little windows of representation. If I wanted to read about a black family that reminded me kind of of mine, I could read like the Addie American Girl books. If I wanted to read about a black girl who, you know, like was dealing with colorism within communities of color, I could read another book. If I wanted to read a book that made me feel seen as like an independent young woman, I could read, what, a big one for me was like Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte, any of the Bronte sisters books, which, you know, have huge implications in terms of still being like Victorian imperialist, but like, did a good job representing what it is to be like a lonely, intelligent young woman trying to make her own way in the world, right? So it's just all these little windows you had to get from different stories instead of feeling unified in representation. Um, so yeah, I would tell her that it's it's okay to, there's no right or wrong way to be Jordan. And I wish that lots of children that don't fit into any particular box could know that as well. Yeah. Um, I guess what I would say is I know for me, I did a lot of moving around growing up. Uh, and so often um, uh, life was about kind of, you know, adapting or fitting into, you know, whatever new space or environment I was in. And I think part of what I would tell me as I was younger is really just leaning into um unreservedly, unabashedly, with great joy, you know, those things that, you know, really feed who you are and that you really enjoy, uh, that, that, you know, uh, that you really enjoy and, uh, yeah, just trusting it, you know, and, and just, uh, and just allowing yourself in, in some regard, just kind of like Jordan was saying, allowing yourself to just be, you know, and, and just flow with that. And it will, you know, it all, it will all come together <laughs> like that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's wonderful. It's so it's, it's wonderful to have those perspectives. And in a lot of ways, it sounds like what you're doing with your lives, you are um, doing that aspect. You are providing that space for people that you interact with and, and, you know, Jordan, your writings to to see those things that you maybe didn't have the connection or you didn't you weren't able to to get so much you know, when you were growing up so that's that's a beautiful thing um i think we robin also says amen thank you for sharing and um that's a great encouragement and uh you know th th again this is really this really warms my heart i i really appreciate both of you for sharing this because it isn't, it isn't something that, you know, we can come here and, and it's a light conversation. It is something that is pretty, pretty heavy and, and nuanced and has a lot of layers to it. Um, I, I can also wish, you know, in some ways as I'm listening, I'm like, man, if I was a guest, I, I have a lot of other things I can say too about this, but I, I was so honored to just help facilitate this conversation with you. And hopefully we can do um, more conversations in the future about other topics, but uh, we are getting, we are past six now. We want to be respectful of everybody's time. But um, one more question here is saying, oh, Robin, thank you so much for empowering our younger and older generations. Thank you, Robin, for that. And um, we just want to thank Mitzi and Jordan for taking their time to talk about representation and why it matters. And again, uh, we will be back next month at our Care Together. We'll have uh, Carrie Morrison. She has an initiative for radical hospitality. Um, talking about the unhoused individuals, and she does a big, big things in, in uh, Los Angeles County, so we're excited to have her, and we're also going to be at the NAMI California Conference next Thursday, or next Thursday and Friday, so the 25th and 26th, if you need more information about that, you can go to the NAMI California website at namica.org, and again, um, we will be back in uh, in better, in another form um, as well, because we have a inner own voice presentation on the 30th, so that's the next time you'll probably see me if you want to sign up for that, go to our Eventbrite. And um, and all the questions about NAMI Orange County, you can go to namioc.org, namioc.org. All right, everybody, thank you again for coming and uh, we'll see you on the next one. Wait, there's two more, two more Q and A's. Okay, 
Angelina, the conversation is much needed. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Angelina. And thank you. This was great. And then Robin says, thank you, Ed. All right. So much praise. Not a lot, a lot of great feedback. So I appreciate you all for being here. And um, we'll see you on the next one. Bye now.